Hi, Dr. Han. I'm meeting you for the first time. How are you? Very well, April. Thank you so much for this invitation and for your hospitality. Thank you. I just, I really need to say that um, you were the first speaker we had booked for our very first conference. You were so kind uh, to, you know, go out on a limb for a, a new organization and you are now the last speaker we get to speak with and you <laughs> hung on so tight through COVID, through the reschedules. And I'm just, uh, we're just really um, impressed by um, the professionalism of your, your group and St. Paul Center. And um, I keep hearing all the feedback of the Bible studies during this virtual conference now. And I just really wanna thank you uh, from a human to human level. It just, um, you were the, one of the biggest reasons that people wanted to come to a conference that nobody knew anything about. So huh. thank you for, um, I, I don't understand that, but I am grateful for your flexibility as well as your professionalism and whatever God's gifts I can bear to you and to the others. Wow. Yeah. I am, I am deeply humbled and truly honored. Great. Well, praise God for that. Thank you. So we only have, um, we could spend hours and hours and hours talking to you. We do have some good questions. And so I think what we'll do is we'll get right into it. Um, uh, I'm, what I'm gonna do is play the, the question and then, um, and then we'll just give it a go. Okay. Okay, first question. My name is Eve Jakes uh, from Our Lady of Chenstohova Parish in Turner's Falls. And the question I have is, uh, why is uh, contraception incompatible to a covenant marriage, a Catholic marriage? I'm waiting for your response. Thank you. God bless. Bye. Thank you. Uh, that's an honest and courageous question and one that many people have and sometimes fail to ask for a, a variety of reasons. You know, so this is an issue that is deeply personal to me and to my bride, Kimberly, of 41 years, because we go back almost 40 years when we were evangelical Protestants preparing for, for me to become a Presbyterian pastor. And I was not Catholic, and I was anti-Catholic, and I won't go through the whole story, but to say that contraception was the unlikeliest cause of the beginning of our conversion because probably every Catholic I'd ever met had rejected the church's teachings of Humanae Vitae, which is what Pope St. Paul VI published way back in June of 1968 to renew the perennial teaching of the Catholic Church. Uh, when Kimberly read it, she was persuaded. Uh, when I read it, I was also opened and then eventually persuaded within a matter of days. I had more reluctance and more resistance, but overall, uh, the arguments I found were persuasive, but what was even more surprising than that was the discovery that up until 1930, every single Christian body, every Protestant denomination stood in lockstep, shoulder to shoulder with the Catholic Church on this unpopular teaching rooted, as we would all say for centuries, rooted in the natural law, rooted in sacred scripture, as well as rooted in the unanimous voice of the the church's living tradition. Uh, now, these are all arguments from authority, and so that wasn't enough for me, but it certainly opened myself to the possibility that I could be sincere and yet still be sincerely wrong, since for us in our marriage counseling before we, in our, in our, in our pre-Cana counseling, it wasn't a question of if we would use contraception or not, but what are the forms that we can choose from, and then we selected it and then uh, Kimberly's discovery, and then my discovery within a matter of days, led us not only to a change of mind, but also to a change of lifestyle in opening ourselves up to what is really unique about the love in a marriage covenant. And that's where I'd like to start, just the thing that we really found persuasive, not just changing our minds, but really moving our hearts. I mean, rocking our hearts was the idea that, well, I mean, love, you know, back in the 70s, uh, love was, you know, uh, L-U-V. It was the post-Woodstock era. And so love means never having to say you're sorry and all of that squash. Um, 
And we were learning early on in our marriage that no, love means being willing to say you're sorry and to forgive seven times a day or 70 times seven. Love for us as a married couple was unique. I mean, you have love uh, between parents and children. You have love between siblings. You have love between neighbors. You have love between coworkers, uncles and aunts, cousins, you know, all across the board, teammates, teachers, and fellow students and colleagues. There's only one form of love that God has created that is designed by God to reveal what is unique to God. What is unique to God? That he is the creator of all things out of nothing. And why did he create? He gets nothing out of it. So why go to the trouble? Well, he's not getting more glory for himself because he possesses infinite glory from all eternity. The only reason is the freedom of love. And so the freedom of God's love is what releases the freedom of God's power to fashion all of us. Now, we can call ourselves creative, but we're not creative like God. So what does God do? God enables us to become, as Pope St. John Paul II put it, co-creators. And he was just sort of summarizing and paraphrasing what he was reading along with us in Pope Paul VI, Humanae Vitae, on human life, which came out way back in 1968. So this unique form of love that is designed by God to be experienced by married couples, and only in the sacred confines of this covenant, of this sacrament, where the two become one flesh, as we read in Genesis 2. And the one that we become, in the case of Scott and Kimberly, is so real that, that nine months later, we had to come up with a name. And our firstborn son, Michael, was the incarnation of our love, the embodiment of our union. And so the two became one and then suddenly became three in one, uh, what you might call a triunity, uh, where we get the word trinity. And so suddenly we discovered that the deep logic of love that flows out of being made in the image and likeness of God there in Genesis 1, 26, is, wow, to be co-creators, to look at a person you know, who didn't exist one year earlier and only exists today on his birthday, December 4th, you know, 1982, because of our love and because of what God has done to empower. It's not just egg and sperm. It's not just copulation. It's not just perpetuating the species. We're looking at into the face of a person who is destined to, to live forever, not just as a child of Scott and Kimberly, but as a child of God that he has entrusted to us. You know, and so if you're looking for just like a logical argument that will force the will, you know, or rape the intellect, or just impose itself, you know, I think you're going to come away sort of disappointed that the church doesn't offer that kind of persuasive argument or demonstration. Instead, it's the logic of love that is embedded in this act that we desired for so long we were able, by God's grace, to withhold until our wedding night, and then eventually for us to have six children who are all incarnations of this oneness, of this love. You know, that is the thing that we found, not just mm, persuaded, you know, okay, we're persuaded by this. We were, um, we were knocked off our feet. Our, our hearts were rocked. Our lives were changed. And it seems to me that the technological, industrial, abstract approach that our culture takes misses the mystery. And not just here, but in many other places too, but especially here by reducing sex down to just an exchange of pleasure, by reducing sex down to something that is temporary, voluntary, you can enter into it and then walk away from it at will. I mean, the wreckage that this has caused is for me something that our modern culture finds absolutely inexplicable. They can't explain why is it that so many have deep wounds and scars that go back to early, early years? Well, the logic of love is more about love than logic, but there's a deep sense to it that I think the church has preserved, that these recent popes have proclaimed, and that reluctant Protestants who are the least likely to hear it, much less be persuaded by it, were, through the grace of the Holy Spirit, changed forever. 
Um, and that was, we were still probably a million miles from becoming Catholic way back there in like 1980. But I tell you, in some ways, our first step, we discovered later, has become, for many cradle Catholics, the hardest step, the one obstacle, the impediment, or the wall that keeps them. And, and, and so if you're going to look at this just simply in terms of divine command, you know, and fear, I don't want to go to hell. And so, you know, tell me what I have to do. Make it, you know, make it clear so I can just check it off my list. You know, that kind of servile mentality that approaches God more in terms of, well, he's my employer, I'm his employee, he's my master, I'm his slave, you know, so do I have to? Whereas the freedom of being the children of God and discovering that he's enabling us to raise children for him and who will become brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it's almost too good to be true until you realize this is the truth of the gospel. This is the truth that sets us free. And I could go on about, you know, how even apart from Christianity, you have in the natural moral law, this thing that Aristotle recognized and many other pagan philosophers who just had open minds that, you know, when you have a male and a female entering into this committed relationship, the children that they will generate are going to need the permanence of their love and the commitment. They're going to come from that love. They're going to be the result of the egg and the sperm uniting and all of that. But you know, again, Aristotle would understand what I meant when I said that there is no other human act. I mean, you can eat with someone you love, you can take a walk, you can see a movie, but there is only one action from which every single human person who ever came into existence is the result of. Right. And so right. you want to protect that. Likewise, Judaism, Orthodox rabbis have pointed out that if you look at the Mosaic law, you will see that when are women said to be impure? Well, during their menstruation. How long afterwards are they now cleansed? According to the book of Numbers in Leviticus, seven days. So do the math. What does that mean? You don't have relations with your wife during her period. You don't have relations until, voila, her fertility has returned. Gee, I wonder if God thought of that. Yeah. And the Orthodox rabbis, apart from Christianity, and so likewise, in early Christianity, this was one of those things that wasn't the result of proof texting from the New Testament, but receiving a tradition from the old and going all the way back to the logic of creation and the natural order and the natural bond of marriage. And the fact that there is this consensus for 2000 years among all Christians up until 1930 and our denominations that began to compromise from the 30s through the 70s, then suddenly within a matter of years, open the doors to legal abortion. My own mainline Presbyterian denomination, once it caved in on contraception, now has a document that refers to an abortion as an act of Christian stewardship, snuffing out the life of a child. You know, when you reject the logic of love, you're basically, you're turning away from the light and the truth of God's love. So I tried to squeeze an ocean through a funnel. Please forgive me because it feels probably more like a fire hydrant than a water fountain, but oh, that's the best I can do. <laughs> well, it's important. And, and I, I'm curious about the listeners that are thinking, well, what if I don't want to have a child right now? You know, the, the questions about contraception, um, but what about the, the times that I just don't want to, or, you know, the, the act of having a baby is, is a selfless act in, in an essence, even though we want to have children sometimes, but anybody that has a child um, or several children, we can see that it is a gift from God. Um, but there are seasons in our lives, um, whether it be um, even financial, even though we need to, to trust a lot more, but sometimes right. financial, sometimes illness, sometimes stress. Um, wh what would you say, you know, if contraception doesn't work into our, uh, you know, the way that God saw marriage, what about the times that we just don't want to, or we can't physically have um, children? That's a great follow-up question. I mean, obviously, infertile couples are still capable of entering into that deep communion, you know. But again, I think back to what Paul the Sixth is stating in Humanae Vitae back in sixty-eight, and what John Paul the Second is amplifying through his theology of the body, that in Genesis one, be fruitful and multiply reveals the procreative meaning of marital sexuality. And then in Genesis 2, the two become one reflects the unitive meaning of human sexuality. That in marriage, the two become one, and it's not just a physical, psychological experience, 
It's a deep unity that goes beyond just my body and your body. So the, the inseparable meaning of the procreative and the unitive, you know, I think this, again, is another door into the, the logic of love. But you raise a, a really important question because there are certain circumstances that the church recognizes which allow for natural family planning, uh, periodic abstinence, clearly affirmed by Pope Paul VI yeah. in Humanae Vitae. You know, it's not the same thing as using a contraceptive pill or any diaphragm and IUD and that sort of thing, but periodic abstinence, you know, uh, for grave reasons, the, the reasons should be serious, but at the same time, they're also subject to the couple's prayerful discernment with spiritual direction, usually from a confessor or a spiritual advisor. But, you know, uh, if you go through a period of uh, a time where physical illness or financial crisis or just psychological circumstances, you know, then, of course, periodic abstinence, natural family planning, charting and all of the rest. This is not only allowed, but encouraged. But I think the mindset that we discover from the deep wisdom of Mother Church is that you will practice natural family planning or periodic continence, but always with an, an element of regret. I mean, with gratitude for this option, but at the same time, it's like when I take medicine, I am grateful for the medicine and for the professional advice of my physician who prescribes it, my pharmacist who fills the prescription and all of the rest. But there's always a sense in which you, you're taking medicine with an element of regret. You're glad for it. You recognize your need for it, but you can't wait to not need it anymore. And so coming back to this logic of love, the inseparable meanings of the of the procreative, be fruitful, multiply, and the unitive, uh, the two become one. You know, I say this with some hesitation, but I think I should say this because I always hear Kimberly saying, and she says it better than I can, but I should say it as best as I can say it. Um, and that is when you run into people who perform other acts, you know, um, eating, for example, what is the primary purpose of eating? Well, obviously nutrition. Well, but that doesn't rule out the secondary aspect of fellowship, of friendship, of communion, you know, and just the good taste of the food, you know. But what happens when people are saying, you know, I just want to have the food, the good taste, uh, but I don't want to have the nutrition. So I'm going to eat whatever I want as much as I can and then purge myself because I don't want the weight. I don't want the, the nutritive end that will certainly happen causing me you know, to gain weight. Well, I mean, rightly that is called an eating disorder. And, I, and I, I've had experience with loved ones who've gone through it and you can see the deep division in the soul as well as the harm that can be done to the body. When you separate these two inseparable meanings, you do yourself harm. And that's true for something as basic and as essential as eating. But it's just as true and maybe more when you tear apart the two, the procreative and the unitive meanings. So the answer at the end of the day is yes, you know, absolutely. April, the, the church allows us to practice periodic continence through natural family planning, the Billings method or whatever people choose. They ought to have the information. They don't, they, they don't, they shouldn't have the pressure to enter into marriage as though NFP is the norm and that you know, if you don't practice NFP at first, no, NFP is there as a, as a, a, pro, a provision that can be used with a good conscience on the part of both, uh, you know, both the husband and the wife, but at the same time, with a certain reluctance, uh, a humble gratitude, but it's one of those things where you'd like to reach the point as soon as possible, where you don't need it, so that the life-giving power of love in our marriage can be not only revealed, but embodied. It's so uh, wonderful to hear you speak about the family. I know you have a large family and um, I, I had a, um, a, a question I was going to ask you at the end, but maybe I'll sneak it in now. You have sure. uh, two sons that are entering into the seminary, correct? Or right. that they're, they're in the seminary. Yeah, right? well, okay. So we've got six kids. Uh, we've yeah. got um, five sons and one daughter. Uh, one rose and five thorns. I'm very close to Hannah, my daughter. She's married. She's got four kids. Her husband is a convert from the Mennonite tradition. He is the dean at Christendom. Uh, I'm so proud of him. Um, 
and the five kids, the five sons, let's see, um, two of them, Jeremiah and Joseph, 28 and 25, are both in the seminary. This summer, Jeremiah got ordained to the transitional diaconate for wow. the Diocese of Steubenville, and Joe came back from a 30-day silent retreat and had discerned after three years of uh, seminary formation that he won't go to Russia. He will stay in Steubenville. He had this missionary passion to maybe be a priest in the Archdiocese of Moscow. Uh, we're not ungrateful for the fact that his 30-day retreat has caused him to discern to that he's going to be working with his brother. So Jer is scheduled to become a priest next May. Joe will be ordained to the transitional diaconate in two years, the priesthood in three years. And so uh, our oldest son, Michael, is uh, he's got six kids. He is a professor of scripture at Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, training up the next generation of priests with a lot of solid teaching. Gabriel has nine kids. He's out in Denver. Wow. Uh, and he has a, a CPA in addition to a master's in theology. Uh, but he's doing his best with a large family, three adoptions. They just had their uh, ninth child naturally about, uh, well, earlier this month. And David, our youngest, is 21 in the uh, the university here where I teach and where all of his older siblings went. Uh, and so I, I think that covers all of the bases. But yeah, I mean, That's uh, we do feel blessed. I mean, deeply blessed. But we also feel like uh, Christ alone has, <laughs> has merited this. I have made more mistakes in my marriage and family than in every other area of life put together. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to ask, have you and Kimberly talked about going to confession to your sons when they become priests? <laughs> oh, we were just talking about it yesterday <laughs> and we have before. Uh, Kimberly says she will, if she has to, on her deathbed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told, I've told her that whenever my students get ordained, if they're, if they're local, I usually go to them just to disabuse them that they were taught by some kind of saint because I'm still a sinner who longs to become a saint. But uh, I do look forward to going to my sons for confession just to let them know, you know, that I am a struggling husband and father who needs their prayers as well as the grace of the sacraments that they are empowered by the spirit to administer. And so uh, they've been forewarned. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, I'm so glad I asked because that's such a beautiful, I can just envision the the father humbling himself to the son. And that's, that's He'll beautiful. be my father in that, in that sacrament. He will confer upon me, not just the discipline and the instruction uh, that I gave to him growing up, but he will confer, you know, a discipline and an instruction that is truly supernatural. Uh, I was their breadwinner for so many years. Now they'll become my Eucharistic breadwinners and I don't <laughs> hide from them the pride, the gratitude and the humility that this yeah. gives to me. That's amazing. Ah, oh, that's so fun. Uh, okay, well, speaking of the family, there was a, a question about your uh, uh, past book that you had. Let's hear that question. Did I? Thank you in advance for your time and attention. Oh, sorry, my bad. Okay. The Benedict Option was a popular book a few years back. I was wondering on your thoughts regarding its message of withdrawing from the culture. Is it truly possible to raise a family that reflects or mirrors the Holy Family in our society today? Thank you in advance for your time and attention. Wow, good question. I thought the first one was hard. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, okay, so Rod Dreher wrote The Benedict Option and I have read through it. And I, uh, there is a lot in that book that attracts me. Um, because, you know, what we're really talking about is allowing ourselves to form a, a Catholic subculture, a family subculture. And I think that it is proper. It, it might even be necessary. There's a great deal of wisdom. Uh, but there's also, on my part at least, some hesitation, uh, because I don't think that the model that we should embrace the understanding of the Benedict option that many people, people have is a kind of Amish Catholic option or you know, a kind of halfway option where you know, like the Mennonites are not as radical as the Amish, but they are isolated and somewhat enclosed as my, my former Mennonite son-in-law has explained to me. Uh, I do think we are called to be leaven uh, in the bread of culture. 
and that our responsibility is to transform the culture, as Jesus put it, to make disciples of all nations, not just individuals within those nations. Uh, but what happens when you are in a culture that is so toxic? I'm thinking especially of Lot and his wives and his daughters who were in Sodom and Gomorrah and who were called to leave. You know, and other instances like the first generation of Jewish Christians who were in Jerusalem until the persecution and the corruption grew so intense that they literally had to run across the rooftops and flee once the sign of the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy. You know, and so we are pilgrims wherever we live. And so heaven is our home, as St. Paul reminds the Philippians, you know, our, our, our commonwealth, our citizenship is in heaven. On the other hand, you know, the anonymous epistle to Diognetus in the second century reminds Christians who read it that unlike the Jews who would always kind of form their own groups because their laws would basically say we're contaminated once we come into contact with Gentiles and other things too. Uh, Christianity made it so that we're not going to be defined by the, the dress or the, the hairstyle or the diet that we're going to basically find our way to fit into any culture, to transform that culture, uh, and to live family life, to live married life, to form friendships with non-believers, not just to manipulate them into conversion, but to really show them that the gospel is friendship with God. I no longer call you slaves, I now call you friends, is what Jesus said to the disciples in the upper room when he gave them the Eucharist. You know, and so I think what we have to do is, you know, on the one hand, inhale that is, breathe in the breath of God's spirit, go back home and gather together as a family for prayer, you know, and make it so that the cell phone or the TV are not the defining instruments of family life. They're peripheral. They kind of fit better outside the home. And so prayer, song, meal times together, uh, games as well. So you're playing and praying. That to me is not forming a ghetto. It's not forming a kind of uh, underground Amish Catholic uh, cell. At the same time, when you inhale and you gather together in your home and just renew the wellsprings, then the hope is that you can send forth your kids and you can go forth yourself with your spouse and really enter into work and make your work so well that it's not only your prayer, but it's also your witness to your coworkers. Likewise, enter into friendships with your co-workers, especially non-Christians. Find what values you do share. Stand together on that common ground. It might only be music, movies, or, you know, whatever, but find it. And if you can't, then look on for another friendship. But to me, this is, the inhaling is what it means to follow Jesus as a disciple. The exhaling is what it means to be an apostle and to be sent out in order to share what it is that we have been given so freely and so fully. Just to hold it in and to kind of stay away from everybody else, to me, is sort of like trying to inhale but not exhale. Uh, it's trying to follow Jesus as disciples but not allow him to send us forth because the world is just a scarier place than it's ever been before. Right. This calls for great wisdom on the part of parents so that they're not sending their kids out as you know sheep before wolves to be slaughtered when they're not adequately formed. But at the same time, it calls for a, a humble and yet bold trust in our Lord working through the spirit in the sacraments for our kids. And even with the help of their guardian angels, you are praying for them to be faithful witnesses as disciples who follow Jesus and apostles who bring others to the Lord himself. I mean, I don't think Rod Dreher would disagree with anything that I have just said, and I don't think I disagree fundamentally any, with anything in the Benedict option. It would just be a change of emphasis. I would put the accent on different syllables than he does. You know, I suppose I would point to the, you know, the Saint, the Saint Jose Maria Escriva option. You know, I have received formation now for over 35 years from Opus Dei and to turn work into prayer to see, you know, friendship with pagans as part of your lifestyle and to recognize that our call is to sanctify the temporal order, not just the domestic order. And so this isolationist mentality is understandable, but I don't think it'll work in the long haul for our own fidelity to Christ. At the same time, remember Lot, remember Noah. There will come a time where for the sake of our households, we've got to do the equivalent of building an ark or fleeing. And we recognize that so much of the expansion of the Catholic Church from the first century to now has come because we recognize that America is not my home. 
heaven is. That's where my citizenship is. So if the circumstances ever required me to leave this land as a pilgrim, that's how this land was settled and repopulated. And so we ought to be open to that option ourselves. But I think as a last resort, that's sort of the the, the spiritual equivalent of the nuclear option. I hope that helps. Wow. <laughs> uh, I have never read the Benedict option. I, I'm sorry. I assumed it was this uh, book that you had written, but it's it's not. And so... Um, no, I, but but now that you mentioned the book that I did write, yeah. I've actually written two books. One has been out for two years. The other one's going to be out in like two weeks. Uh, the first one of those two is called the first society the sacrament of matrimony and the restoration of the social order yeah several days of the week that's my favorite book you know and then it just you know it's like whoever whichever child i'm with is my favorite child but that book was on my heart for a long time and i can sum it up in the you know with, with the opening story because when i was converting as a doctoral student in a seminar led by a jesuit priest this theologian stated and i thought he was exaggerating you know, it was back in the 80s when the moral majority, you know, was causing a big fuss. What is the role of religion in the, the public square, if any? And Father Keefe just said, you know, if Catholic married couples simply lived the, the grace of the sacrament of matrimony for one generation, the result would be a transformed culture, a Christian society. Apart from the politicians, we succeeded in electing whether they kept their promises or they broke them. If we could just keep our vows and receive the sacrament and live out the grace, we would transform our culture. That, to me, is much more of the Escriva option of St. Jose Maria. Uh, and then the other book I'm just finished up is, is called It is Right and Just, mm. uh, the, the Future of Civilization and why it depends upon true religion, or why the future of civilization depends upon true religion. And so how the Catholic faith alone has this capacity not only to form civilizations, but also to reform cultures of death. You think of imperial Rome and not just postmodern secular America. So uh, it is right and just is coming out in a couple of weeks, and the first society came out a couple of years ago. You know, um... Uh, you know, speaking of your books, uh, on a personal note, um, I am um, have a true devotion to the Eucharist at, at this point in my life as a as a Catholic. Um, but I have to say, and I know you're going to give God the credit, but through your words in um, the Lamb's Supper and the Fourth Cup, um, it painted a different, uh, such an amazing picture for me. Um, uh, I, when I was a child, we have a perpetual adoration chapel and I would sit in that chapel. I didn't really understand it much. Um, you know, I was young, but old enough, like 14 to understand that there's something special here. I used to call it the cotton ball room. You go into this, you know, chapel and you just feel like you're just being hugged, you know? And so I knew that there was something to the Eucharist, but until I had heard it, I, um, uh, I love messianic prophecies and I love the, 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 the history. And I love, I love proof. I'm, I'm very much a Thomas. And so hearing you prove to me and in essence, for me to be able to express that to other people um, through, you know, all that you had revealed with your own journey in the lamb supper and the fourth cup, it made, it gave me this um, freedom to be solid in my faith and understanding of the Eucharist. And I just, um, again, just am so grateful that you're willing to put the work in to put it on paper because for the rest of us um, that um, need help, we need, we need, we, you know, whether it be time or intellect or whatever it is, we need your, your um, knowledge. And so we're just so appreciative. It's not like, um, you know, it's not like a superstar mentality. It's like, we need what you have to offer. And so thank you for writing these books. They really oh, are April. helping us along. You're, you're welcome. And you are right to God be all the glory. Yeah. yeah because I, I suspect that if we could look at the proportion, you know, between the truth that I'm writing or, or teaching and the, the, the power and the beauty of the sacred mystery of the blessed sacrament, you know, it's like, uh, a thousand to one, you know, if I can help people approximate and get closer to it, thanks be to God. I should mention that there is now a trilogy of books. 
So the first book is The Lamb Supper that came out way back in 99. Yeah. Uh, and the second one, as you said, is The Fourth Cup, which is unveiling the mystery of the Eucharist and the cross and how the Eucharist transforms the execution into a sacrifice. But the third book is called Consuming the Word, the New Testament and the Eucharist in the Early Church, because I point out that the only time Jesus used the phrase the New Testament, the only thing he called the New Testament was not a document. He didn't say, write this in remembrance of me. It was the Blessed Sacrament. And when he instituted the Eucharist, he said, do this. And they all did this. But most of them, most of the 12 didn't end up contributing books to the collection of 27 that we now call the New Testament. But to discover that being a New Testament Christian requires me to become a Eucharistic Catholic, I feel like it it completes the circuit. The, yeah. the divine electricity can really pulsate through us, I think, much more deeply. So Lamb's Supper, Fourth Cup, and Consuming the Word are, for me, you know, part of the reason why I'm on the planet. <laughs> thank you. That's going to be my birthday present to me. So thank you for mentioning oh, that. Wow. Yeah, sure. great. Um, speaking of our Lord's um, love letter to us, known as the Bible, we do have one more question I think we have time for, um, which I think you'll appreciate. Hi, Dr. Scott. Um, this is Joanne from Gill, Massachusetts. And um, I have so many questions for you, but the one I want to ask is, um, because I appreciate so much the way you put the, keep the Bible before us as Catholics. And um, because I am, have a Protestant past myself, um, and when I talk to people, I have a lot of students that I have conversations with, I find that bringing up the Bible feels cringy sometimes, that I, I feel like I'm kind of going into um, a past way of um, pushing the Bible, pushing the Bible. I um, am disturbed by this, and I um, find it hard to speak about the Bible in conversation and to include verses to be helpful to people. And I wonder if you could um, shed some light on this, on the, the role that the Bible would play as we, we share our wonderful Catholic faith with others. Thank you so much. Wow. You're welcome. Thank you, Joanne. That's a great question. You know, and I'm thinking of two or three approaches to answer the question. You know, on the one hand, I do understand why it might be a little embarrassing to quote the scriptures because of how other people sometimes weaponize the Bible and deploy proof texts like you might shoot bullets, you know, to prove, you know, to kind of set people straight and to you know, and it's just, it's cringeworthy, you know, to build on what you were saying. Uh, on the other hand, April, you just mentioned, I think, a minute ago, that these are like love letters from our Heavenly Father. And they're not just addressed to me or to you, but to us as a family, as sons and daughters, to be sure, but as brothers and sisters as well. And so the reluctance to share might be in part, not only due to the embarrassment caused by the way other people do it, but also because we're so busy, it isn't difficult to find my way into, wow, I haven't read the Bible closely for a few days. And it's when I do read it that it's like, oh, wow, you know, uh, who'd have thunk it? I mean, this ancient document speaks to me today in this moment of my need. It's such a deeply personal thing. And it can't be reduced down to the ancient human authors. There really is a sense in which it is still the mouthpiece of Jesus, the instrument of the Holy Spirit, and it's more than just rhetoric. There really is a reality of a relationship that is intimate. And the more we open ourselves up to that, I think the greater our freedom will be in sharing something that we have read recently that spoke to our hearts. And the more we pray for our family members, our neighbors, our co-workers, our loved ones, you know, the more we're going to sense that the Holy Spirit is moving in their lives. They've got their own weaknesses and needs and troubles. But the Holy Spirit, the more we pray and read Scripture, the more space, the more freedom the Holy Spirit has to connect what I have just heard from our Lord to what my family member or what my coworker needs. You know, so for example, I like to say that if you just saw a movie over the weekend and you're at work on Monday morning, 
nobody's going to think you're weird because you're recommending this movie. They're not going to say, who are you to impose your theatrical taste on the rest of us? Because friends share the things that they enjoy. And the more we enjoy things together, the deeper the friendship grows. And so likewise, you know, if you went to a restaurant that just opened and then went to a movie, and these things are fresh experiences that brought joy to you and to your spouse or whoever, I, I don't think people are going to mistrust you. They're not going to misunderstand. And so if in a non-manipulative, transparent way, you can say, you know, for years, I didn't really read the Bible. And to be honest, I don't always feel free to share, but it's been... God has been using it to speak to me lately in ways that, um, you know, I was just thinking of looking at Nehemiah 810 like two days ago, where I needed to hear it for the 10,000th time, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah, you know, because it's so easy given the COVID epidemic, the cultural convulsions, the peaceful riots and the not so peaceful, you know, uh, <laughs> demonstrations, you know, it's crazy. And so it's easy to give into anxiety. You don't have to go through all of this, but just to say, wow, you know, the peace that passes all understanding. This is what I need. And just earlier this week, this is what I found by reading St. Paul to the Philippians and that kind of thing. If you can share it like you would a novel or a movie or a fine restaurant or just a, a, a local, you know, uh, art gallery or whatever, I, I think that is the way you can do it in a, that, that's truly Catholic and that is broadly Christian. And I think non-Catholics are going to look at you and say, wow, you know, it's almost like Amy Coney Barrett, you know, in the, uh, the tension of the interrogation, you realize she is a fine person. You know, she is, sh she's sharp, she's respectful, she's sensitive. We might disagree, but I really respect the way she says things, you know, and I, I would hope that people might say that about me, and I suspect that people might say that about you, even if you were never on TV before Senate hearings and that kind of thing. But across the spectrum, you know, the big names, the celebrities, the, the public events, down to the most private of encounters, the interpersonal relationships that we have with others, when God speaks to us, we ought to be at least open to sharing the joy, the peace that brings to us with others. Great. You know, um, you mentioned, um, you know, John uh, 6 and um, in, in your books, and I, I have a, a, a special place in my heart for, for John now, and Psalm 23, walking us through that. And I love um, um, walking us through the Psalm. Do you have a favorite book of the Bible? Well, again, do I have a favorite child of, of the six? Yeah. I know. You know. Whoever I'm with, you know. <laughs> Whatever you're but reading. Right now. Right now, I am doing a Bible study on the Gospel of John. So when you mentioned John 6, I'm thinking, you know, this Sunday evening, we're going to have, you know, 25 to 30 people in our, in our big living room area, and we'll be going through the fourth chapter of John, the Samaritan woman at the well meeting Jesus. It's one of my favorite passages, and I'm just renewing the well springs for myself here. But I, I'm, I'm here in the St. Paul Center studio right now with a dear friend and brother in Christ, Beckett. And Beckett comes each Sunday evening with a camera, a little tripod. And so we have been recording these Bible studies in our home for the first time ever. I mean, we had tape recorded back in the 90s when there were dinosaurs called cassettes, you know. Um, but we haven't done that for a long time. And so Beckett is actually helping get these things posted on Facebook. And so at the St. Paul Center site, but also at my public page, Scott Hahn, uh, we, 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 we're posting the last two or three or four weeks of these Bible studies on the Gospel of John. So yeah, that's my favorite child right now, you know, uh, and I would invite you all into my home and to watch this because we are really having almost too much fun. <laughs> I, I am so looking forward to watching those. We have, um, the St. Paul Center has been really generous to us and um, have given us the um, first episodes of your Bible studies that we had posted on our conference that people have been enjoying. And you gave us a promo code to uh, allow us to um, purchase those. And it's like, it's like, which one do I get? You know, we want to get all of them. And you guys just put so much um, time and love and energy into this church as we should but you really have gone above and beyond. And we're just so grateful for the information and uh, not just for ourselves, but our priests who are spreading the word along and our deacons. And um, we have something so special and you've really helped us to um, 
be able to shout it off the rooftops with with um, a solid foundation. And so we're so grateful to all of the work you and your team have been doing and, and continue to do. So um, please know that our prayers are with you as we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, again, thank you so much for being with us and, and joining mm -hmm. us along this two year long journey and COVID. And uh, I don't know <laughs> if you know it, but we, we ended up losing our Bishop in the middle of this. And we're actually we just got a new one this week and we're gonna um, be talking. Yeah, I mean, it's just so exciting to be Catholic. And so we thank you. Well, well April, you're welcome. But I mean, you have no idea how much it meant to me to hear you de describe uh, the superabundance of uh, spiritual wealth from the St. Paul Center because we've been working here for, you know, uh, almost 20 years. We're going to have a, a gala on October 20th, a virtual gala. So I want everybody to feel free to sign up and join us to find out all of the exciting things that have happened in the last year and the exciting plans that we have. So go to stpaulcenter.com. You can sign up for the virtual gala and find out more and all of that. But uh, I just want to say from my heart to yours and to all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, thanks be to God, but thank you, April, and thank all of your co-workers for the delight, for the privilege and honor it has been for me to, to work together with you. God bless. God bless you. Thank you so much. You're welcome so much. Give Kimberly all, uh, all of our love too. I will. Extra hugs from yeah. Massachusetts. Extra yes. COVID hugs. All right. We'll By the way, Massachusetts is where we lived for our first three years of marriage up on the North Shore. Oh, in yeah. Pitch, in South Hamilton. So it's really near and dear to us. Oh, well, we hope to see you in person someday. We were really excited to all meet you, but um, oh, Lord, one, day, one day, one yes. day, one day. All right. God bless you. Take care. Thank you.